When you're shopping for a new adventure motorcycle or any motorcycle for that matter, there's two main criteria that you're looking at. One, is it gonna meet the needs of your specific situation for how you like to ride? And number two, can you afford it? Is it gonna fit within your budget? A lot of people have been asking me, is Yamaha's Tenere 700 worth 50% more in price than Kawasaki's brand new for 2022 updated KLR 650? Both of these bikes will take you to the same amazing destinations. They'll get you down the trail, they'll get you down the highway, and you're still gonna make the same great memories no matter which machine you choose. So the question is, how do you decide if the Yamaha is worth the extra money? And what are some of the advantages that the KLR might actually have despite it being cheaper? Here's the short answer between these two motorcycles. While they're both amazing bikes and they both will take you to amazing places, the Yamaha is a higher quality, higher performing bike. However, there are three advantages that the KLR has that not a lot of people are talking about. The first obviously being the price. You can buy one and a half of these bikes for the price of the Yamaha. The second advantage that the KLR has is the fuel range. With a six gallon tank, this bike can go 300 miles between fuel stops, as opposed to the Yamaha with its 4.2 gallon tank can only go about 200 miles. The third advantage that the Kawasaki has is the comfort. It has a more comfortable seat. It has a better fairing and windshield. It also has an adjustable windshield. The ergonomics are a little bit better and it's just a little bit more comfortable for riding all day than Yamaha's Tenere 700. Although, don't get me wrong, the Yamaha is still a very comfortable machine. Because Kawasaki's KLR is so much more affordable than Yamaha's Tenere 700, and it's ready to go out of the box with the big fairing and windshield, the comfortable seat, the long fuel range, and some pretty affordable OEM accessories like luggage and these extra lights you see here, a lot of people will be able to take this off the showroom floor and, and pay cash or finance it for a very, very low monthly payment as opposed to having to invest a bit more and think more about that decision financially versus getting Yamaha's Tenere 700. Simply put, the Kawasaki is going to allow more beginner adventure riders or more people coming from outside the sport to enter into the field of adventure riding and I think that's a great thing. So those three factors I mentioned are really the only ways that the KLR is better or has more functionality specifically than the Yamaha does. So now we need to talk about why the Yamaha is worth more money and all the ways that the Yamaha is a superior machine. There are three main factors I want to talk about with the Yamaha and how it's better than the Kawasaki. The first is going to be the engine, the second is going to be the chassis, meaning the suspension and the brakes and the handling, and the third is going to be the quality. So let's talk about engines for a minute. So on the Kawasaki KLR, what you get is a single cylinder liquid cooled engine, the same engine they've been using since around 1987 with a few small revisions for 2022, including fuel injection. The bike puts out around 40 horsepower and around 40 foot-pounds of torque. And being a single, it has quite a bit of vibes, quite a bit of vibrations that come through to the rider. Although rubber mounting the bars and the pegs was a nice improvement for the 2022 model. The KLR, despite having a good amount of torque to get you over different trails and over different types of terrain, on the highway, it's very, very slow for a motorcycle. It's dog slow. And if you're coming from uh, pretty much any twin cylinder bike or any modern motorcycle, the KLR is gonna feel pretty, pretty slow to you. So if you're looking to get excitement out of an engine, you wanna feel some excitement of acceleration, the KLR is not gonna deliver that. The KLR is for somebody looking for a lot of utility, the ability to explore bad roads, but it's never gonna excite you in the engine department. The engine on Yamaha's T7 is a whole different story. So the Yamaha is using their CP2 parallel twin engine. It makes around 70 horsepower. It sounds absolutely incredible, especially with an aftermarket exhaust. It's very, very smooth. It has almost no vibration. The spread of power and torque is very linear. It works well off-road and it works well on-road. And Yamaha did a great job because this little engine is the perfect matchup in an adventure bike chassis.
So if engine character, if engine acceleration is important to you and the smoothness of a twin cylinder engine, then that's kind of a game changing feature that this bike has over the KLR and there's just no way that you can make the KLR perform like this. So let's talk about the chassis, meaning the suspension and the brakes and how the bike handles. So let's start off with the KLR. Uh, the weakness of the KLR compared to the Yamaha is the suspension and the brakes are just not up to par with the Yamaha and here's why. The KLR uses a single front disc with an old fashioned twin piston caliper and in the rear it uses a single disc and a twin piston caliper. The rear brake is fine but the front braking power is just not very competitive for modern motorcycles and if you're coming off riding other modern motorcycles you're going to have to readjust to the lower power of the KLR's brakes. Let's talk about the suspension. That's probably the most important thing people are thinking about. So the KLR has a very plush, very comfortable suspension. It absorbs potholes very well. And when you ride on the trail, you really don't feel any of the little rocks and the chatter and the washboard. It does a very good job of soaking up those small imperfections. But the counter argument to that and the counter side of that is that it's extremely, extremely soft. And if you hit any sort of dip or rut, or if you start riding a little bit above a relaxed pace, even at a moderate pace, the bike starts to wallow and bottom out very, very quickly. And I've bottomed this suspension more times than I could remember, and I've only had this bike for a couple weeks. The KLR suspension is also very limited in its adjustments. You have a front fork with no adjustments whatsoever. And, and the rear suspension, they do at least give you a preload with five settings for preload if you have a passenger or extra cargo. And they give you adjustable rebound damping, which does have an effect, but that's it for the adjustments. Let's talk about the suspension on the Yamaha. So with the Yamaha, you get fully adjustable suspension front and back. It's not a world-class suspension, and no, it's not as good as the suspension on KTM 790 and 890s. However, it does have full adjustments. So on the front, you have compression and rebound damping adjustments, although there's no preload, which is kind of a bummer. On the back, you have preload, rebound, and compression damping adjustments. But maybe the biggest difference between these two suspensions, besides the adjustability, is the fact that when you ride the Yamaha a bit more aggressively and you start picking up your speed, the motorcycle, the chassis doesn't just simply fall apart and turn to mush. The KLR feels like you're riding on like pillows um, and it's just constantly hitting the bump stops. Whereas the Yamaha, although it's not the best suspension in the world, it can keep up with how most adventure riders are gonna ride on the trail. When you start pushing the pace, um, going through water bars, going through dips, riding more aggressively, the suspension can keep up with the rest of the chassis and it can keep up with you as a rider and it provides a more controlled, more enjoyable experience. That's something that's gonna be hard to replicate on the KLR without spending a lot of money on aftermarket suspension. So I mentioned we're gonna talk about quality of construction. So let's cover that now. So the KLR, as everyone knows, if you've done some research on the internet and talked to riders out there in the community, the KLR suffers from some issues with its reputation around quality and certain issues that it has. Now, the good news is that for 2022, they've made some improvements. Not only have they brought the bike a little bit more into the modern world with the fuel injection and the better dashboard, the adjustable windshield, they have paid attention to some details and made the quality a bit better. For instance, the fasteners are no longer Phillips heads made of cheese that strip out. They're all hex head Allen um, key fasteners. The battery is easier to get to. Um, they've made things a bit easier to access and things just seem to be one level up in quality. Now, unfortunately, the KLR still suffers from a lot of its longstanding engineering and design flaws. And while some people still argue a little bit about this, it's pretty well accepted that the KLR suffers from a few major issues. And unfortunately, they're still here with us with the 2022 model. The first thing is something called the doohickey. I have another video on the doohickey, which I'll link here. It's essentially the system that tensions the counterbalancer chain inside the engine, and it's not designed properly, and it can re lead to reliability issues down the line. The second thing is oil consumption. KLRs, because of the way that the piston rings are designed, and I have a video coming on this really soon, so stay tuned, they tend to consume oil above 5,000 RPM. And there are many documented cases of riders, even riders that I personally know myself, who have 
blown up the engines by running them out of oil because they went on the freeway for a few hours at a time, maybe a couple times in a row between gas stops. They didn't look at the oil window. The bike got low on oil and the engine was destroyed. And in my opinion, it's unacceptable for a modern motorcycle or a modern vehicle to use that quantity of oil that could result in an engine failure over that short of a mileage time frame. So I don't think that's okay. The third thing that the KLR is kind of known for, which is a smaller thing, is that it doesn't have very good temperature regulation. So unlike most modern cars and motorcycles, it doesn't have a thermostat bypass. What that means is that the bike runs at very inconsistent temperatures as the thermostat opens and closes. It tends to run too cold and results over the long term in a premature engine wear, which none of us want to have. So a lot of people put on something called the thermobob to correct that. The other typical KLR things are still true with this bike. There's still reports, even on this new model, of side panels coming off on the highway because the, the bolts vibrated loose, um, fairings rattling. A lot of the journalists in the press intro had rattling fairings because something wasn't fitting correctly. Uh, but keep in mind when thinking about those things that this is a budget motorcycle. For $6,700 for the capability you get, there's nothing like this. So we sh probably shouldn't complain too much about those smaller issues. Now, yes, it's true that you can address those issues on the KLR and have a very reliable bike. But on the flip side, let's discuss some of the engineering flaws and major known issues with Yamaha's Tenere 700. Actually, there is one small thing I wanted to mention about the Tenere compared to the KLR and something I recently found out. The Tenere has a little bit higher center of gravity and it's actually a little bit harder to lift up. So if you were to drop both of these bikes, even though they weigh about the same, if they're configured the same, the Tenere is significantly harder to lift. And I'm not sure exactly why that is other than maybe it carries more of its weight up high. Now you certainly wouldn't know that when you ride it because when you ride the motorcycle, this bike feels less top heavy than the KLR. But for some reason, when you're parked and when you're picking the motorcycle, up if you drop it the Tenere is a little bit harder to pick up so anyway uh, your mileage may vary on that but that's something I wanted to mention what about maintenance requirements a lot of people have been telling me to put more maintenance information in my video so here you go uh, oil changes air filters chain maintenance those are gonna be roughly the same on both of these bikes in terms of the difficulty and the time required to do it but there is one difference Yamaha quotes a valve inspection interval of 25,000 miles on the Tenere, and Kawasaki is saying 15,000 miles for the KLR. Reliability and longevity is a very tough thing to discuss. It's a tough thing to measure and quantify because everybody has their stories, everybody has their anecdotes. So it's something that I really try not to rate in my videos, but if I have to make an assumption here, I think that because the Yamaha is better quality, it's lower stressed twin cylinder engine and lack of inherent design flaws is going to mean that for the average rider, the Tenere is probably going to hold up better in the long run at higher mileage. That's not to say that a KLR can't achieve high mileages and be reliable, but it's going to need more tinkering and more preventative fixes done along the way to make that possible. So in summary, yes, Yamaha's Tenere 700 is a better overall motorcycle than Kawasaki's updated KLR 650. But then again, it should be because it costs 50% more. However, like I said at the beginning, Kawasaki's KLR will absolutely take you to the same destinations and make the same great memories of adventure trips that Yamaha's Tenere 700 will. So if your priority is simply to have the most exploration, the most adventure you can for your dollar and stretch your dollar as far as you can, then Kawasaki has you covered. If you're looking for a little bit more performance and quality in your adventure bike and your adventure riding, then Yamaha has you covered with their T7. So if you'd like my parting words of advice in this comparison, here's my two cents. I think you should buy whichever bike fits into your budget. If the KLR fits into your budget and the Yamaha doesn't, be happy with your choice of the KLR. 
Now that being said, if the Yamaha fits within your budget, I would recommend spending the extra money for the Yamaha, again, if you're financially comfortable with that. And here's the reason why. I think that it's less likely that you're gonna outgrow the Yamaha. Here's what I mean. The suspension and the power of the Yamaha and the overall quality, I think it's gonna keep you entertained and keep you satisfied um, as you grow in your adventure riding, your skills and your experience compared to the KLR. The KLR will get the job done, it'll take you where you wanna go, but it's more of an upgrade path. It's more of an entry point as opposed to something you're gonna keep for a long time. Although there are riders who keep their KLR for a very long time and they're very, very happy and there's nothing wrong with that. So I hope this was useful. I hope this was educational. Please let me know what you'd like to see in terms of future videos. I have some really interesting rankings coming out with adventure bikes. I've developed a whole scoring system. I'm gonna be releasing that soon. So um, please subscribe and hit the bell. Please leave a, we just had an earthquake. That was really weird. I could feel it outside. That's how good when you could feel the earthquake outside. Um, I'm in California, so we get these. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? Please hit subscribe and hit the bell. Uh, please consider being a Patreon supporter. Leave a comment in all the videos. Hit the thumbs up button. And uh, thanks again for watching. Ride safe and we'll see you.